Good afternoon, everyone. I am Roy Swan, and I am in the way of the main event, but want to take a minute to say welcome to each and every one of you for being here with us today to hear about the exciting work of our esteemed panelists. I can't end my brief remarks without saying thank you uh, to a few people, Nicole Melwood and George Suttles of Common Fund. Uh, some of you may be aware that the Ford Foundation provided initial funding to launch Common Fund uh, roughly 50 years ago. And I also want to thank uh, our outstanding uh, events team uh, led by, and tech team led by uh, Nuluka Levy uh, with help by Elizabeth Pascarello uh, and then Brandon and Adana. And I also want to thank my team, uh, Kamara Haynes and the estimable Margot Brandenburg, one of the nation's leading thinkers on the topic of inclusive capitalism. And now with that, without further delay, uh, George, I'll ask you to take it from here. Uh, thanks so much, Roy. And uh, so uh, I guess I too am in the way, so I will, uh, I will get us going here. Uh, my name is George Suttles, Executive Director of the Common Fund Institute, the education and research arm of Common Fund. And, uh, Roy, I might argue that um, the Common Fund grant that was made in 1971 is arguably one of the best grants that uh, the Ford Foundation uh, ever made. Um, I know that we've supplied our audience the full bios for our panelists, so I just want to give um, quick introductions. But before I do, um, I just want to say that um, we've got the best tech team in the business at the Ford Foundation really supporting uh, this uh, uh, this webinar today. So we've done both the technical piece and the spiritual. So don't worry, we burned the sage and we did all of the things. Um, so, um, but even though we, we are fully prepared, if there are technical difficulties, I ask for your grace and flexibility in advance as our tech team uh, tends to anything that might, that might come up, but we don't foresee it, but just always like to, uh, like to lead with that. Um, so uh, let's begin. So uh, with short bios. So uh, Ms. Gabrielle Gabby Salzberger is a strategic advisor to Two Sigma Impact, a private equity firm that combines active principled ownership and data science with the goal of achieving, achieving superior returns and positive social outcomes. Gabby currently serves on the board of trustees for the Ford Foundation, the board of directors of Eli Lilly and Company, and the board of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Ms. Valerie Rockefeller has a master's in education in special education from Bank Street College of Education, try saying that three times fast, and a Master's of Arts and Teaching in Secondary Social Studies from Columbia University Teachers College. She serves as a trustee of many academic, nonprofit, and cultural institutions, including Achievement First, Columbia University Teachers College, Greenwich Academy, and the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, just to name a few. Ms. Rockefeller was also a trustee of Spelman College and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Mr. Ray Ramsey is an independent trustee and member of the investment committee and interim CEO at the Nathan Cummings Foundation. He has focused on fulfilling the commitment to align 100% of the foundation's endowment investments with mission related investment strategies. Ray is also founder and CEO of Century Capital, an investment firm designing and executing impact investment strategies with a focus on real estate development and affordable housing as a platform for human advancement. So now that we've introduced ourselves, uh, we thought it would be fun to learn a little bit about you in the audience. So we have a poll and I'm always excited about polls. And whenever we have that capability, I like to utilize it. So uh, we're going to launch a few poll questions to learn more about the community of people joining us today. Uh, this information will help us be most helpful to you um, as we guide our conversation. So uh, let's please uh, launch the poll. Um, and it's just going to be collecting some information about um, the institutions and organizations you're representing. Um, asset size um, for the institution and where you are in your investment journey um, in terms of investing in diverse fund managers. Awesome, so it, it, it seems like um, we've got a nice, nice mix um, with a majority of folks representing um, institutions in the endowment uh, and foundation space, about 60% of you are representing um, 
institutions in the endowment and foundation space. And then we also have a nice mix when it comes to um, AUM um, and asset size. Um, so we've got some bigger players um, as well as some midsize and, and, and smaller um, endowments. So uh, this is really, really helpful information. So I think um, as we move forward, it's also going to be important for us to think about not only how not only how the larger players are implementing strategies, but also sort of what can the midsize and smaller endowments and foundations do as well. Um, let's go ahead and launch our uh, third poll question, please. Oh, look at that! Zero percent marked no interest. Um, so that's that's uh, that's encouraging. Um, it seems it's pretty split. You know, folks are interested and they're exploring, and that's that's probably what brings them here today. Um, others are, um, you know, sort of just on their journey, and they're probably looking for tools, tips, and tactics um, to figure out how to more deeply engage with investing in diverse managers. And then there's a nice percentage of folks who are, have a robust, who have indicated they have a ro robust strategy. Um, so it just seems like we're we're in good company here um, as we sort of are all on this journey uh, together. So uh, thank you all for engaging with us. I think it's always fun since we can't be um, can't be together um, to try and gather information about who's in, who we're in community with. All right. Um, thank you so much for indulging me as I sort of did a little bit of housekeeping and collected some information. Uh, let's jump right into it. Um, so Gabby, want to start with you first, and I think the fundamental and philosophical question. Um, we're asking ourselves is why is it important to allocate capital with firms owned by women and people of color? Um, and how, um, how's the Ford Foundation thinking about that? You're on mute, Gabby, no worries. Um, so yes, thank you. And thank you again for the organizers for, for putting this together. I, I'm really looking forward to the discussion as well. It's great to be here. Um, so yeah, so I'd love to say a little bit about what Ford's doing and then um, really spend kind of most of the, my comments talking about why we think it's so important. But um, as I think most of you all know, um, you know, Ford, um, we are privileged to be a very large uh, private foundation that's um, focused, our, our mission is really focused focused on um, this, this, the social justice mission of um, reducing poverty and inequality. And so as a result, it was very logical for our board and trustees to, you know, um, over these last years to really think about all, really all aspects of what we do to make sure it's aligned with that mission, but in particular to, to get into some really deep conversation around, you know, our investment philosophy and policies. And so where we landed in that um, set of conversations four years ago was creating, um, you know, a program, the mission related investing programs, which Roy, who opened our session of runs with his team. And, um, and, and what we did in that was we decided to dedicate a um, billion dollars of our endowment to, to really focus on, you know, mission related and, and investments that directly support and align, you know, with our, with our broader purpose. And as part of that, um, the notion of inclusive capitalism is, is really, you know, kind of foundational. Um, I think we all know, you know, that, um, while women and people of color represent 70% of the U.S. population, um, we we only manage about 1% of all the assets, and so you know that's just you know kind of fundamentally problematic. And so really important to us through this program to to prioritize around investing. Um, and supporting diverse managers. And it was really, you know, kind of a very clear part of the mandate. In particular, you know, we've been very focused on um, identifying and working with um, racial and ethnic minorities from underrepresented groups. Um, and, and so I'm pleased to say kind of four years in, um, we are very, very proud of our portfolio. We've invested in 45 um, different funds of which um, 37 are diverse. And as we define diverse to be um, firms that are owned at least 25% women um, or people of color. So, you know, the fact that 80% of our funds, high performing, great quality funds um, are also diverse is something that we are really proud of. 
Um, and 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 proud for a number of reasons, because but we do think it's just fundamentally important. And and I think we think about that in two kind of larger categories. One is just you know um, a performance related. Like we've all seen the data. We know that more diverse teams get better outcomes. Um, we believe in and the data kind of supports that in the investment arena as well. And so so we believe there's opportunity to increase the performance across the board of all of our you know, funds um, and generate alpha by making sure that um, we are, you know, have the most diversity possible. And so that's just kind of a, a fundamental belief. But secondly, we also recognize that these asset managers represent and manage a particular category of capital that's growth capital that's really important and has other impacts beyond the direct impact and kind of you know gets to a notion of the theory of change and so i'll share a little bit of data that kind of gets to this and, and again like why it's so important and the impacts that this can have and, and why diversity is so important in this area um, so, you know, over the last couple of months, we've been doing some research um, and looking at the traditional funds, the large, well-established, successful, by a lot of measures, white funds. And we took, you know, the 18 largest venture capital and private equity firms. Um, and we know these firms are typically, it's part of their business model to be private. I mean, they're private, so they're not very transparent. But there is a moment when they are more public about their information, and that's when their portfolio company goes public. So we, look, we took those 18 firms and we looked at every single company that was in their portfolio that went public over the last 20 years, because we thought that was an important indication of you know, how the firms were running themselves, but also, again, back to the impacts these companies have and the kinds of companies that they create and support, right? They're, they're investing in companies, they're helping to grow companies. Well, to that point, those 18 firms created 845 companies that went public that represented a trillion dollars in market cap when they went public and over time are now worth 11 trillion dollars. So these are high growth companies. They generate a lot of jobs. So we looked at those companies and we said, okay, how are they run? How are they governed? So those 840 companies over 20 years had about 4,400 people on their respective boards. Of those 4,400 people, 49 were black. A little less, a little, a little over, like right about one percent. About one percent were Latinx. So that's over twenty years. Forty-nine people out of forty-four hundred board seats, and the numbers are actually worse when you look at the C-suite. We did the same kind of thing. Those same eight hundred and forty companies, eleven trillion dollars in market value. They had about 4,500 people in their C-suites. That was like, you, you know, general counsel, head of HR, your CFO. Again, 20 years, there were 29 black people across all 845 companies, only five CEOs. So if you ask me like, why is diversity important? You know, it's exactly that, like, you know, left to their own devices without intent, without kind of diverse thinking, they are they are growing companies, they are creating companies that are not diverse, they're not diverse in their leadership. And, and that creates all kinds of inequality. And so, so we are working very hard to try to make help those companies, the mainstream firms be more diverse but also it just underscores why investing in diverse managers is all the more important because we know they over index and have different networks of diverse CEOs, diverse boards, diverse companies that, you know, that are serving different communities. And, and, and so it just becomes all the more critical. But, but we found that data um, pretty compelling in this overall conversation as to, to, to why it's important. Because right now, the traditional firms are not serving these communities and people at all. Uh, Gabby, thanks for that. And you, you, you really sort of dropped a lot of knowledge there. Is that research that you referenced public? 
Is, can, can um, you know, that? the Ford, the Ford Foundation has um, been underwriting this effort. We literally just in this last week have begun that this is one of the very first conversations that we've begun having about the data itself. We and we are, we have the data to be clear over 20 years, we can look at any five year period and we have it as it relates to every individual firm within, you know, this cohort. So, you know, so we're, 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 we're not, you know, here to shame or out any, you know, some firms are doing reasonably well, some are doing not so well. Um, I think our, our real interest is in kind of highlighting that this as a group of firms up to now, you know, ha have, have, have not been really um, kind of addressing this issue. And so we need to see a lot more intention around that you know, in the traditional firm. Again, you know, we, we also, it just underscores in our mind why it's so important to invest in diverse managers because they are clearly addressing what's been a huge gap, you know, over th these last decades. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I want to make sure I bring in uh, Ray and Valerie, but it sounds like what really resonated with me at least was intentionality and leadership. Those are sort of keys to us advancing this effort. Ray, want to uh, bring you in, sir, um, your thoughts. Well, I, I think um, Gabby kind of laid out most of the uh, of the issues for why. I, I think um, you know all I can add is a couple of you know extra points on it, which is one, you know everybody, whether you're the Fed Reserve or whether you're a policymaker, cares about having a resilient economy, and so the only way that economy is going to be resilient. Uh, and meaning sustainable is that it's it has to, by definition, cut across regions of the country as well as populations um, of the country. You know, divided up into different into different groups. So you can't get there by concentrating all the wealth and then thinking that that's going to sustain itself. Then you've got other uh, social dynamics that go into why do it because social cohesion in a democracy matters. And so you cannot assume that you can forever allow that concentration or to allow it to continue unabated and you're going to have social cohesion. And so I think, you know, in addition to the, the business case for the performance also going up, which has been stated, it's, it's overwhelming. And, and there are study after study, McKinsey's done a study, others, there are numerous reports to look at the performance of diversity rather than non-diversity. And so we have to turn the page from having that debate, but it's surprising how often that still mm -hmm. interjects uh, into the mix um, about, oh my God, the trade-off. And you can just hear it in the subtle forms of language. And so we've got to try to get that out or call it when we see it. Um, but the case is overwhelmingly um, compelling. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks so much, Ray. Yeah, it seems like the roadblocks are, are, are more, are, are more perceived than real, um, especially yeah. when you're looking at the over, overwhelming data that's showing us that uh, women and people of color when asked to uh, um, manage money actually either performed a benchmark or um, outperform their peers. So, um, Because you know, it just stands to reason, right? If you're gonna manage capital, one of the things attenuated to that is knowledge and wisdom, trends, understanding what's going on. So you're doing dynamic analysis of that it's very difficult to know that if you don't recognize the broad sight lines that are required. So you can't take a narrow scope and with a rapidly diversifying uh, um, world that we live in and in this country where you, by demographics, um, by region, um, by ethnicity, we're diversifying. So that means we've got to figure out ways as an investor side to expand your aperture. And part of that is who's at the table because everybody has blind spots. And so it's, what do you do about your blind spots? You expand your aperture by bringing the right people to the table. Absolutely. Valerie, I wanna bring you in. You've been patiently waiting um, and I know you've got some good stuff to share. Well, thank you, George and the Common Fund and to, to Roy and the Ford Foundation for having us here and for everyone who made this possible. I will add one more statistic, which comes from a recent Goldman Sachs study that even just closing the wage gap between for black women um, would add a million and a half jobs to our economy and a point and a half to our GDP every year. And that is just one subset of the different populations that we are looking at when we're looking at diverse managers. Um, this work is important. I think, of course, I have three children. That's the most important work that I do. But I would say the most impactful work that I've done uh, 
through having the opportunity to chair the Rockefeller Brothers Fund is what we've done with our endowment, which is at 1.4 billion right now. And first through fossil fuel divestment, and then a natural corollary to that has been the, the work on uh, diversifying our fund managers. And just as we divested from fossil fuels to support our grant making, um, which just quickly is in peace building, sustainable development and democratic practice. We work in China, Central America, uh, the Balkans and Afghanistan and Israel, and of course in the United States where our democratic deficits and, and social inequities are just as deep as they are, are everywhere else in the world. Um, we, in our grant making, we prioritize small, mid-sized organizations led by diverse grantees, grantees who are representatives of the re regions where we work. And so just again, as we wanted to align our endowment with our sustainable development grant making, of course we want to align our endowment and our investments with the work that we're doing. We also, an added benefit is that the transparency, which I'm sure we will talk more about, uh, we put everything we possibly can up on our website, um, rbf.org. And that is a huge part of this movement is just starting this conversation is really important. You're not sure where change is gonna happen, but the to measure the impact that you're gonna have is important, but you never know what you're gonna achieve just by asking questions and giving people opportunities as well. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. Thank you for sharing that, Valerie. And and I want to I want to stay with you because as chair of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, I, I'd love for you to share a little insight um, into sort of how what are those conversations like at the board level when you're when you're ha when you're discussing or when you were initially discussing investing in diverse managers. Was there pushback at the board level? Was everyone all in and it was just a matter of implementation? Uh, did that bubble up from the staff or was it, was that conversation led by the board? Just give us a little bit of context around sort of conversations at the board level and where, where they started. Yeah, thank you. I'm obsessed with process because it's so telling. Fair enough. <laughs> and it, I would say fossil fuel divestment um, started more at the board level and with the diverse managers and then enthusiasm, you know, as soon as you start thinking, why are we undermining our grant making with our investment? <laughs> then you know, the exact same thinking prevailed when it came to being more inclusive in our, in our investment managers as well. Uh, I will say though that the, the initial um, energy around it and knowledge around it came from staff, our executive vice president for finance and operations, Jerry Watson. And then also we um, outsourced our uh, endowment management to an OCIO called Agility six years ago. Um, I just have to brag, since then we've outperformed our blended benchmark by 1.8% with a quarter of the volatility uh, that's in the fossil fuel work and also in, in divert, having diverse managers. So from Agility, our, our um, primary, Chris Pittman, who runs it, and also our, the people we work with very closely, Tamara Larson and Amina Schultes, not coincidentally, I'm sure, women of color who got us into this work. I will say just with anything that happens at a foundation or well within any family, there is a lot of discussion around it. It took us a while to get to what exactly were the appropriate metrics for us, what was a fair benchmark for us, what type of goals to set for ourselves and how did we wanna measure where we were. Awesome, thanks so much, Valerie. Um, I, I wanna bring you in, Ray. If you could tell us a little bit about the discussions at the board level um, and where where they um, originated from? That'd be great. Yeah, you know, we'd be delighted. You know, I I um, as you can imagine, you know, when you're wearing the extra hat of also being the CEO of a foundation, so people pursue you. You know, as an asset owner, so they think you've got money in the back of your pocket. And one of the things I, I say to folks is it, it takes four yeses um, to get there to make some of these fundamental changes. You know, you've got the the CEO that represents the staff you've got your trustees, you've got an investment committee, and you've got the investment professional, whether that is an outsourced, an OCIO, or an internal CIO. All of those have to create the right cacophony to get to yes. And so it's not just a single shot thing. It's not even just the only the dialogue that happens at the trustee level. And so I just wanted to give you, you know, that texture. And so they bleed together. And so this was very much a blended conversation. Um, with all of those players, including in our case, um, the global um, endowment management gem um, that's our outside uh, um, CIO 
And we, we brought in a group called Frontline Solutions because we wanted to have multiple voices uh, at the table. And I would just describe Nathan Cummings as, and I often say this, we're restless, we're aspirational, while at the same time being data-driven. So we brought in outside people to give us data. We had the aspirations uh, in, our, in, our, in our hearts and we're restless, right? And so there is a, there's a journey that, that people have been going on in philanthropy. A lot of it started with the ESG movement. And, and so it's like, do no harm. Let's make sure we're doing right by sustainability the, to the environment. And then more shifting into impact, although there's a lot of work to be there. But once you say that you're gonna do impact, then in an enlightened way, you begin to say, what about the diversity that's happening inside of that? And what you have to confront, whether you use the terminology or not, is the issue of power. And, and being able to, to deal with that terminology, understand what that means and the dynamics of that. And so our conversation was all about those subject matters, but at the heart of it is, what does it mean to have power? What does it mean to share it? And what does it mean to provide um, the, the atmosphere for other people to participate? And that, that sort of captures the conversation, but we followed Ford um, and went forward and we were on a journey, but then Ford took the bold step and put the billion dollars and we're a lot smaller. So we said, well, we're, we're not gonna segment. We're gonna put all of our endowment to go um, um, 100% mission aligned um, and impact. And then in terms of our data driven work, we brought in people from Kellogg, we brought in Rockefeller Foundation and folks at Agility to talk to our trustees and to address them. So we would always bring in the fact bound uh, mixed with our aspirational uh, and, and our restlessness. So that, that would summarize our discussion. No, thanks so much, Ray. And Gabby, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna bring you in. Um, what conversations were you all having at Ford at the board level? Um, where did they instigate from? Just would love your insight. Yeah, you know, and, and I think, um, you know, there are clearly some simil similar themes that, you know, as Valerie and Kent Ray just described, what is a little bit different is when we first started having these conversations. And, and so we launched our program in 2017. The, pro, the conversation started well before that. And it was at a time when there weren't a lot of others out there doing it. So, you know, um, in fact, there were no others. Um, and so, you know, what kind of comes up and, and it's very, I mean, so much of this is just like kind of human nature is, you know, um, there, there is a kind of, you know, I think in some areas kind of an inherent conservatism, you know, and, you know, it's new and it's different for folks and, you know, and, and obviously, you know, kind of being like, we're all very, you know, being stewards of our endowments is kind of like job one, two, and three. And so, so to the extent there was not, you know, kind of an understanding or appreciation of kind of the talent that was out there, like kind of like there was just the human nature kind of questions of like, Wow, will we be able to put the money to work? Will we be able to find the, the funds? Well, you know, what's the talent pool look like? You know, and, and so um, you know, some just like just really kind of kind of you know fundamental questions like that that we had to um, really, I think, in a in a careful way because we couldn't go out and say like, oh yeah, here's X, Y, and Z who've done this before. Um, we had to really go out and you know kind of a, a, and and do the work around to get people comfort that there was that kind of pipeline of talent and opportunities and funds, and that took time, you know. And, and people kind of were coming, at, the trustees were coming at it from very different kind of places. Um, but we felt and believed, and I think in retrospect, we're right, that we wanted to have not just support, but strong, enthusiastic, support, you know, kind of consensus and, and commitment to um, a, a longer term, you know, program that, um, you know, that could potentially have like, you know, hit, hit some bumps in the roads and that, you know, people would be so solidly behind that even if we did um, need to tweak and refine um, that, that we had that, you know, kind of level of support. But to be, to be clear, you know, I, I think in some cases, people were really starting at a deficit of little or no information. And we had to start by kind of bridging that and, and, and addressing some of just the, you know, just the lack of information that, that people had. And, and that, that was really a kind of a critical 
part. part. And, it, and it wasn't just about talking. It was like actually bringing in some of the really talented, extraordinary managers who've been at it for a long time, who had track records, you know, um, but had never had the opportunity to, ma to manage capital for a foundation before, you know. So, so, I, so it was some of that kind of work that was really, I think, very illuminating for people and very important um, to do. So it took real time. Um, but as I look back and I think like, what are the things that we did that was, you know, really, you know, that was, that was clearly part of it. And, and we have been fortunate, you know, we haven't like the kind of bumps in the road that we thought we actually haven't like our funds. It's like things have gone extraordinarily well. We've built like incredible pipeline. They are amazing managers. They're performing extremely well. And so, you know, everybody's been, you know, really, you know, just really, really pleased and, um, just has allowed us to do even more than I think we had, you know, initially hoped for. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Gabby. And I think sort of for the first part of our conversation, it was a lot about the why. Why are we making these strategic investments? Why it's important? Um, but sort of given time constraints, because I could, I could spend hours talking to the three of you about uh, a, a myriad of topics, I, I want to get into implementation, right? So we've covered the why, now we need to think about the how. Um, and Ray, I, I want to start with you first because Nathan Cummings Foundation has committed to having 100% of its investments aligned with its mission. So how does investing in diverse managers fit into this strategy? Um, is there a difference between this investing in diverse managers and like broader impact strategies or are they integrated? And really what, what did you all do to get this going and, 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 get, and rev up your journey? So implementation, yeah. implementation tips would be great. Thank, thank you, George. I for me, you know, when looking at this, I would just say it begins with humility. Um, and you, you start with the aspiration, but you have to be humble in the sense that um, you don't know exactly what each step is going to be prescribed at. And, and it's very difficult to be predictive of everything. And so it's a journey. And so on that journey, when we said impact and mission align first, then we had, again, that, that blended dialogue, um, particularly coming from our staff, which is deeply rooted in, in social justice. And, and I often say, you know, I channel them, you know, when I'm at the table and it's always, what about? And I think in a very positive way, who's met? So it's the next question and the next question, who's managing? Who, how do we measure that? What's the definition of, of it? Is it full ownership ship or is it, so is it 50% or is it 25%? And so there are a series of questions that come up and we just keep adding in a good way, another part. And so we, we, we have a study, um, a report that's coming out next month. So a matter of weeks and, and we call it a value proposition. And it's really about the value proposition of going impact and having this screen of having um, people of color participation. And so we are going to be adding that uh, component um, to the mix. And that study, um, we engaged with uh, starting out 115 uh, OCIOs that led us to having a broader dialogue with a uh, deeper dialogue with uh, 18 um, CIOs. And then from that, we're putting that information out and, and the conclusion was, when you look at all of that data, all of that information from the CIOs, um, I could summarize it by, by saying um, the water is, is warm and good and you can get in. Um, but there are a lot of different trends that will come out of that value proposition report. And, um, but again, it begins and it ends with the humility. We are going to keep learning. We seek out information and additional texture from other people and we're continuing to learn and get uh, good ideas. I also want to mention um, another organization, you know, that we've learned a lot from um, Abacus and uh, Rachel uh, Ravascotti and her work at what's called Due Diligence 2.0 and that commitment. And we were a signatory to that. And that is all about how do we overcome the assumptions and the biases. And so biases that are built in some of them just very simply around, well, how much AUM, assets under management, did you have? There's, there's, there's language that's very loaded, and that language would then become a proxy for exclusion. And so we've just got to be, and that's what I meant earlier about issues of power, which is who's at the table, and are we extending access, or are we closing down access? 
Thanks for that, Ray. Um, unfortunately, uh, looks like we lost George. Um, oh my. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to uh, step in here. Um, oh wow! Yeah, sorry, Roy. <laughs> No, no, listen. Right, you're I'm, a master of all trades there, huh? Yeah, right. well, <laughs> just, yeah, takes all roles. I thought I didn't see him on the screen, and then there you are. Great. <laughs> yeah, he. I, I didn't give him a hook, so I don't know. <laughs> don't, don't blame me. Um, so, But he's already set a bar, a high bar, so I'll do my best. But I'm. this is a, a, a topic um, that um, I'm just uh, wondering about any conversations you're having with um, other institutions. And, and I wanna take a minute uh, and just thank Gabby for uh, the deep engagement um, she has had with our team mm -hmm. as a part of her oversight function. And in fact, this convening um, really was inspired by Gabby as a way to um, for us to engage a bit more about what we're doing and learn about what we could do better. Uh, but as a part of that, and I'll start with Gabby, what are you, what are you hearing from uh, your peers, your trustee peers at, whether it's uh, other foundations, I know you're on uh, the vestry of, of a very large uh, religious organization. Um, so if you could spend a, a minute or two just talking about what you're hearing from your peers. You know, and, and I think part, I mean, part, part, I, I, it's been a tangible, I think, change in the tenor of the conversation since last summer, honestly. Um, and, you know, kind of prior to last summer, I think there was, in, you know, there was interest, mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, kind of for a whole set of reasons, you know, I think last summer kind of the, and that, and hence some of the conversations that you and I had about, you know, us, kind of opening up a little bit more and sharing kind of what we were doing from a, you know, kind of a pragmatic perspective, uh, because, you know, it, it is fair to say, and yeah, I'm on the board of Trinity and Sesame Street and um, the Met, all of whom are fortunate to have, you know, sizable endowments and all of whom have kind of found themselves in a spot where, you know, they, they looked at their portfolios and, you know, they didn't have the diversity that they wanted. And, 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 and I think that, you know, when you're starting from ground zero, even if you have the support of the, of the board, um, you know, um, you know, you, you, you kind of like don't exactly even know where to really begin and how to begin identifying managers and so forth. So, you know, I, I think um, what I'm hearing is a much heightened level of interest and it's coming from, you know, both CIOs and trustees. Um, and, you know, and so, I, and, and I think, you know, it's what they're really kind of looking for is kind of pragmatically kind of what's the path and how do you, you know, do what we've been talking about one like build consensus, you could have some very well intentioned, you know, you know, kind of groups of trustees, but you need to bring a whole board along, you need to bring the CIO, and then you need to help, you know, educate folks kind of about kind of what the set of opportunities looks like. So, um, so, um, but the, sh the short answer is I'm encouraged that I'm hearing um, kind of a level of interest um, in this area that um, in my, you know, dozen or more years of doing this kind of work, I have not ever heard before. That is so encouraging. And I'm going to uh, ask Valerie the same question. Then I'm going to drop off because I see my good friend George has, has rejoined us. <laughs> so I'm going to make myself scarce. Valerie, do you have anything uh, you'd like to add to that question? Of course, first that, of course, you're a natural collaborator, Roy, and, and welcome back, George. <laughs> and, uh, and I hope I'm not being, I hope I'm being competitive, uh, consistent here, not repetitive, when to repeat some of the words that, that Ray and Gabby have said, you know, the, about opportunity and also about equity around this. I think one of the, it's not, it's not a challenge, it's just a consideration to make is, I think it's more one of time than supply. Um, when you are looking at, you know, your diverse managers, where we start is with a questionnaire. Of course, we know from the research and from our own experience that it is a better investment to invest with more diverse managers who are investing in more diverse companies. And so you want to do the questionnaire to find out exactly, you know, to help you make an, an individual assessment of the quality of the investment. But you also want to be able to look at peer um, data 
And you want to be able to consider as well how sophisticated these managers are in their approach to diversity. So not what they're doing, because when you do a questionnaire, it is just a snapshot in time right then, right? And we found when we put gave a questionnaire to our managers that there were some who actually were willing to engage in conversation about what they were doing to be more inclusive, but they were not willing to fill out the questionnaire. So we started with that, about three quarters of the funds with whom we invest did reply. And that data has been very helpful to us in, in having these kind of conversations that Gabby was talking to. And I think, again, the data is what's gonna make this field grow. As with anything, you have to be able to prove the effectiveness of what you're doing. And because of the inherent sexism and racism in our society, yes, some of these managers, most of these managers are not gonna have as long a track record. That is just another consideration that you're gonna to have to make when you're looking at them um, and that might be a conversation that you're going to have to have with your board. It may feel like another level of risk, but it's not. In fact, it's a safer, better investment. It's just going to look perhaps a little bit different than other investments that you've made or other fund managers that you chose. Uh, absolutely. Thanks, Valerie. And apologies. Um, it is uh, the internet versus George Suttles and uh, apparently uh, the internet. You won uh, yeah, the, the internet won the battle, but, but isn't going to win the war. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to uh, be, be back with you. Um, just looking at the time here, um, want to, um, if you all don't mind, just uh, taking uh, facilitator privilege, I just want to sort of open it up for Q&A. We've gotten the, the chat and the Q&A has been pretty, um, pretty active. So um, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll, we'll jump right there. Um, does that sound okay? Gabby, Valerie, sure. Ray? Oops. Awesome, awesome. Now I'm nervous. I'm like, oh, I'm here, I'm here, but any minute, you know. But apparently any, you've got a very good backup in Roy. <laughs> absolutely, and Roy, my gratitude to you, sir. Thank you for stepping in. You know, teamwork makes the dream work. That's one of my favorite phrases. Um, I, I think I'll pose a question because I saw it asked um, several different ways in the, in the chat. Um, when we're thinking about metrics and measurement, um, are, are, how are you all thinking about building that evaluative framework and then holding your yourselves accountable? Um, you know, sort of performance to date um, at you know when you when you set longer term goals. So talk to us a little bit about about that metric metrics accountability evaluative frameworks um, and how are you um, from on a board level thinking about building those? Um, Valerie, I'll start with you um, because I know Rockefeller Brothers Fund definitely has defined um, defined goals around um, investing in diverse managers. So we, we look at fund ownership, we look at fund management, we also do look at the pipeline and we look at the diversity of the, of the portfolio uh, companies in which they've invested. So we have not set a time limit for ourselves and when we are gonna achieve these goals, this is an approach we took with fossil fuel divestment as well. We, we pay agility based on their performance. And so we wanna leave them as much flexibility as, as possible. Obviously it's a relationship based on trust and we know that they are, uh, you know, focused on, on being inclusive. And so we did not set a time limit, but we did, we are going to measure our progress towards our own metrics by, we want to get up to 25% and then higher, of course. Uh, right now we are, and, and have a goal of 30% of the individual portfolio companies being um, managed by uh, underrepresented minorities. We're at about 16% now of our funds that are, are that are owned. If you look at um, ownership of funds and management of funds, we're actually doing a little bit better on the management of funds. We're at about 53% of our funds right now. Or, and you know you have to consider the pipeline, but we're not going to measure ourselves that way yet. We're really holding ourselves to this metric of looking at the percentage that are uh, not only owned and managed by a diverse group, but it has to be by underrepresented minorities in the finance industry. Uh, and Valerie, I'm going to stay with you for a second and then ask Ray and Gabby to, um, to jump in here. I'm getting a lot of questions around when you're diligencing uh, funds, how are you thinking about ownership, right? Because there's the 25% of ownership by, you know, women and people of color. And how are you all thinking about um, percentage ownership when you're diligencing diverse managers? That's how we're looking at it too. Got you. Um, Ray, Gabby, we want to bring you in. Ray, uh, could you just provide some insight in terms of how you're measuring, um, you know, how yeah. you're, the, the frameworks you all are using? Yeah, and, and I would say it's, it's our grade is not complete. Um, we are designing 
um, our metrics. We have broad goals um, of where we want to be, but we, we we're right now avoiding sort of trying to cap it, you know, and because we don't want to, we don't want the unintended consequence of sort of saying, well, we've reached the 25% and, and our work is done. Um, and so the first thing it started, like everybody else is you've got to measure it. And so it's like, where is it now? And then you start setting some benchmarks. And we, we're in the process of our strategic plan uh, in the organization. And we just uh, adopted a new theory of change uh, earlier this week um, and weekend. And so all of our metrics, all of our other forms of measures will be tied back to our overall theory of change. And so we're not just going to have this standing out there on its own as though it exists on an island. It's part of a broader theory of change for the organization and about how we can drive uh, justice um, through the intersectionality of the environment uh, of race and the economy. And so we're looking at all of that in totality. Um, in terms of the very specific question, again, we have been leaning on our outside CIO to give us data and they have, and we set a higher ownership threshold, but that doesn't mean, you know, it's not, I'm not making qualitative differences between, because we're gonna run into a wall if we only have it at 50%. But right now we're looking at 50% um, or more of ownership, but we're also gathering data at that 20 to 25% threshold level as well. And so it's looking at ownership as well as the management um, um, of what's going on there. So right now we're doing heavy data collection, but we haven't finished what I call our benchmarking work. And we have more work to do uh, at the investment committee level and at the trustee level. Absolutely. And um, I, Gabby, before I bring you in, Ray, I just wanted to give you the opportunity when we were preparing for this um, session, you mentioned that Nathan Cummings is, is preparing sort of a case study um, around this work. Can you talk just a little bit about that? Because I think that's going to be good um, good data for folks to grab well, you, on. You just made our, our communications department very happy that yeah. uh, when we're out here, you know, they plug us with different information and I'm known for going off script. Um, but I did, for the record, uh, you might have been uh, uh, when you were down where I talked about, it's called values proposition. And, yeah. and what it is, it is uh, the information that we went out to the market um, and spoke with uh, and got data from basically every uh, outside CIO that you could find, um, over a hundred. And then we leaned in and we did this in conjunction with Frontline Solutions with 18. And so there are a series of findings that come out of that report, literally what is going on now and what are they doing all the way from the measurement world to um, the barriers that have been identified, all of that data. And then we did something very unique. We hired a writer um, to take you on the more bespoke journey uh, of the board and the team, and they conducted interviews um, all the way from my predecessor, what was in her mind, what was going on. So you're going to get this parallel of findings and our own journey, and then we share that with the field. And and again, like I've pointed out, you know, I benefited personally being in this role from reaching out to Rockefeller Brothers and, and their wonderful CEO and CIO and folks at Agility. And we had time with Kellogg. So we, again, this is part of our whole thing that we don't have all the answers. So we've spent a lot of time talking to other people um, about what they're doing. And some of that is reflected here. And so when we hired Frontline, we said, go out and talk to other people and bring that back. Um, and let's figure out how we utilize that information. And so the values prop uh, proposition report will be available um, next month. And we'd be happy to send it out to, to everybody. And we've got some interviews on set up. So I'm very excited by that report. Thanks so much, Ray. Uh, Gabby, want to bring you in, apologies. No, that's okay. That report really um, does sound um, fascinating. I'm looking forward to seeing that as well. Um, and, you know, um, I think we, we may come a, in between, like a little in between what kind of what Rockefeller, Nathan Cummings, um, and that we don't have goals. We've talked about that, you know, at different points. I mean, we do have, and from the outset had set up some very um, kind of clear metrics and not just about diversity, by the way, but also with regard to kind of creation of jobs and other, you know, economic indicators. 
Um, and, um, and so we assess those, you know, periodically and where we are, our, our progress against you know, all of those. Um, and, and I'm intrigued about the idea of goals. I think that there really is a role of goal, you know, cause you can always like when you achieve a goal, then you can use that as a moment to, you know, move the goalpost higher. Right. So, um, but I, I think in, in our kind of, as we kind of viewed it, because so much of this was, and, you know, to use Ray's um, expression earlier, like kind of having a sense of humility about it, it was new. And we kind of wanted to give the team, you know, our, our team the ability to kind of to have this evolve and to kind of see what we learned at the end of the first year and, to, and so we're like super pleased that 80 percent of you know our managers are diverse based on our definition 25 percent ownership like we think that's really fantastic we didn't go in there with that goal in mind um you know um we knew we had an you know a, a large aspiration about it but we didn't didn't have a number um, you know, I, I think, you know, we've just kind of monitored it, you know, quarterly and, um, and, and, and there have been points when we kind of thought, you know, we'd like to be able to do more. We'd like to have, you know, kind of a higher weighting. Maybe we'll slow down on some of this other stuff so that we can, you know, focus and, and, and focus on building the pipeline of whatever is the category that we're, we're looking up, you know, of managers. Um, so, so there was kind of fine tuning that happened along the way. Um, and, and I think for us, it was important to have the flexibility, you know, to do that because, you know, recognizing again, that there was learning that was gonna need to happen. There was pipeline development that was gonna need to happen. And George, if I can jump in on that, part of my steep learning curve around all this has been the this pipeline pipeline piece of it. And why, yes, you actually have to look at who's in the C-suite. You know, if you're if, if you don't have, you know, an underrepresented minority on the investment committee making having a voting power over investments, then it doesn't count. But it is important to engage in the conversation and to look at who's in the pipeline and to really gauge how seriously a, a fund is is taking this. And, and I, I just want to make one other, Valerie is just making an important, and, and I think, you know, she, she touched on it also in this questionnaire. I think it's really valuable just having the questionnaires, just engaging with these managers and asking them what they're doing, what, how they're thinking about things, what their plans are for, divert, you know, it's very, very impactful. It is really kind of the first time that, you know, as a field, they are hearing from us that we really care about this, that it really matters. Like, you know, they, it is a way, you know, it is just another way that we can can really there, there's investing in diverse managers. There's also working with this much larger pool and letting them know that this is important to us and just asking the questions about what their strategy is, what their intent is. That is a very powerful set of conversations that are being had, and, and I think a way we can continue to make make impact. It's very important. Absolutely, and Gabby, just to stay on that point, do you think that same sort of line of questioning? and trying to engage with your investment partners, it, there's an opportunity there too, um, because there are oh, some, sorry, go ahead, Gabby. Ab absolutely, I think it is really critical. Again, it is a way, you know, we can really, it, but just, you know, we don't have all the answers, but we, but, but by asking the questions and, and by them knowing that we are going to ask again a year later to see kind of what the, pro it, it is, it is, it is having an impact when they go back to their partnerships and they are kind of making decisions that, that all of a sudden they, they know that they're, customers and we at the end of the day are their customers you know that that, that this matters that, it, that that we care about it's it's very very important it's a way we can really make a difference George I want to just comment on that asking questions I know uh, time is is moving um, and there's not a lot that I can say but but we are living real time a lot of what Gabby is saying because later um, in a matter of a few months, we're gonna announce our new, you know, uh, what decision we've made with our OCIO work. And so we did an RFP out to the whole field. So you can imagine how these questions, as Gabby is saying, showing up, and we're about a few weeks away from the face-to-face -face, uh, Q&A. And so all of this sort of like rest, and I'm gonna be part of that. And as I was saying earlier about what you bring into that room, the questions you asked, like Gabby was saying, it's a very powerful moment, you know, where you show up with your theory of change, you show up with your values, that always, that always comes into the room. So this is very real time. 
um, for us. And uh, so that announcement will be made, you know, in a couple of months. Absolutely. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, Ray, time is of the essence, but I want to make sure that we, we, we cover this question quickly and I want to get your thoughts on it. Just for the, the quote unquote, the, 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 the smaller endowments, the little, you know, the, the little guys, um, for lack of a better, um, how do they engage? So if I'm a $100 million endowment and I don't have scale, I don't have capacity, um, how do I start to think about investing in diverse managers? Just would love to do a round robin and get your your thoughts. And Valerie, I'll, I'll start with you first and then bring in Ray and Gabby. Mm -hmm. Well, again, to look back to our fossil fuel divestment experience, there are more um, agility offers now, a public equity fund fossil fuel that you can get into. There are There's more opportunity to, to get into this work. And again, just use the power of asking questions, even if you can't get access to those funds, that, the, that that's part of the marketplace of ideas out there is, is an important tool that you have. Awesome. Ray, any advice, guidance? Yeah, I would say um, along those lines is that th there are first internalize the importance of going impact. And when you go impact, it necessarily leads you um, and should intentionally lead you to, to where diverse managers go. And, and lastly, there is an initiative that will be announced soon um, of an organization that is going to commit to assisting 1,000 um, management uh, professionals, um, diverse management professionals, from a technical assistance side, which is one of the barriers that, you know, getting the pool larger. And an entire foundation is going to be committed to just moving the needle with those managers so that by 2030, 1,000 managers will have been impacted. So stay tuned for that. That'll be a very exciting announcement. Awesome. Thanks, Ray. Gabby, your thoughts? I would just, um, I know we're out of time, but I just, there are also, there are a couple of fund of funds that do this kind of work, have excellent track records. You don't really have to view this as a concessionary kind of, you know, approach. Um, so um, if you're a smaller, you know, endowment, you know, it could be a logical way to get kind of, you know, some diverse exposure into, into this field of diverse managers by by with some of the very highly very well regarded um, fund of funds that have been doing this kind of work for years that so that would be another just way to get at it awesome thank you all so much and gabby as you alluded to we are out of time i want to thank gabby valerie and ray thank you for your generosity your expertise and your patience with me as i combat the internet it's a daily daily struggle but uh, still i rise um i want to thank Roy and Margo um, and my colleagues and friends at Common Fund uh, with a special thank you to uh, Nicole Melwood, who's a director at Common Fund. Without her, this event doesn't happen. Um, I want to thank all of you out there for joining us. Um, we are going to make sure that we, all of the data sets that we've discussed and all of the reports, we'll make sure that we figure out a way to get that out to you as available and as appropriate. I also wanna thank the Ford Foundation tech team for bringing me back, bring me back to life. Really appreciate you. And I'm uh, just uh, incredibly grateful to be in community with all of you. Um, take care of yourselves out there. Um, thank you so much.